The motorist never lived who hasn't driven a lonely road somewhere at night and asked himself, what would I do if I rounded one of these curves and saw a human body prostrate on the pavement? How could I ever convince the authorities that I hadn't been the driver guilty of manslaughter? It has befallen my lot in a million miles of motoring not only to think that thought, but see it become reality. It happened late of a summer night down in the mountains of West Virginia. I was returning to North Carolina after a conference up in Charleston. Luckily, I had two passengers, a lady and a man friend, but that made the experience no less gruesome when it came. I'll tell you about it in a great many words. You know, the mountains in the southern end of West Virginia are like the walls of skyscrapers in lower Manhattan. When they start up, they start up sheer. Roads are mere passageways cut in deep ravines. Houses are miles apart. So is road traffic in the item of cars. We work down past Bluefield in a night without a moon. Now and then we'd pass a truck. It was either hauling John L. Lewis's coal or spiritus liquors. At the foot of the steep grade below Bluefield, we met a truck coming up. Then nothing for a mile but trees growing close to the macadam. And our strong headlights picking up more and more road curves. I thought the celebrated thought, what will I do if I round one of these curves and these headlights pick up a human body on the pavement? Of course, as a good citizen, regardless of what Winchell and the journals were saying about me, I'd load it aboard and rush it to the nearest hospital. But where would I find the nearest hospital? Would there be a nearest hospital in all of West Virginia? Thereupon, I reached the bottom of the grade turned a curve, and there, on the pavement, a hundred feet ahead, saw a male figure prostrate. My heart turned over, my ignition went haywire, and the engine missed four beats. Don't lay any bets that I failed to remark, well, this is it. The lady was riding in the front seat beside me. A party I'll call Dan was riding in back. The lady squealed and Dan gasped. Both had seen it the same instant I had. That truck we'd passed a half mile up the grade had undoubtedly felled this nondescript gentleman of the Old South. And I, being a furriner by all Dixiecrat standards, was up for manslaughter. Then the humanities came into play. Perhaps he wasn't dead but sleeping. Perhaps he'd merely been spun by that truck and was lying prostrate to get over his dizziness. Anyhow... I let the Buick drift down beside him. I jerked my safety brake. Dan got out before the car had ceased motion. He was a veteran of World War I, Dan, but he too was a furriner from up north. And if we got blug on our fenders by reason of draping the remains over it to convey them to the nearest hospital, even the word of a lady witness wouldn't guarantee our innocence. I didn't know what to do, and so did nothing. Nothing but sit in a spasm of imagination and visualize how I might look strapped in the electric chair. Dan had struck a match above the prostrate figure. Gad, he called softly, not only bleeding like a stuck pig, but his left arm is missing. His left arm? Missing? Had that truck wound up one of the unknown man's arms in its viscera and kept on going? I saw myself leaping from the electric chair and overtaking that truck, flagging it down and admonishing its driver. What's the idea scramming off with another guy's spare parts? As a matter of fact, I was inclined to feel bilious. And do you know what caused that biliousness to cease? It was the victim with the half-arm absent. As Dan's match died, he roused himself from stupor on that pavement. He sat up, perplexed. Next, a roar split the silence of West Virginia canyons. Hey, he demanded, in a voice like John L. Lewis defying the Supreme Court, where's my blankety-blank-blank blank truck? This, as the lower-class grammarians say, was the payoff. Where was his truck? It must have been delirium. Assisted by Dan, he got to his feet. He was the longest, lankiest hillbilly I'd ever set eyes upon in the aforesaid motoring mileage. He was drenched in gore down his shirt front, what shirt he was wearing, must as to pants, an old greenish coat, and a pancake cap. 
and his left forearm certainly was absent somewhere. Anyhow, it was off at his upper left arm at the elbow, and by no means lying on the pavement. Somebody must have kicked it into the brush. Maybe some night animal had carried it off to feed its young, but he certainly would stand upright. And he could swear. He could swear in all the brands of plain and fancy profanity that has made the South famous until he happened to see the lady bee beyond me on my right. Oh, excuse me, he apologized, and he backed away, reached for the pancake cap with his good right hand, swept it from the smallest head ever exhibited on a human being, and made a deep bow. He was the queerest acting dead body to be found in the South, or anywhere. But I had to remember I was in West Virginia where John L. Lewis bossed some odd ones, dead or alive. Anyway, the chivalry bored me. How come... I cackled. You're lying out here in this midnight dew, and where did all that red ink come from on your turkey bosom? Well, we got the straight of it, but you'd never guess what the straight of it was. Make certain, when you come upon your dead body, that the straight of it is as good. First, he was the owner of that truck we'd met back up the grade. Second, He'd hired a goop by the name of Pajowski to drive said truck out to a watermelon farm that day to load it with melons for sale in World Marts because, in World War I, he'd had his original forearm removed by pig iron at St. Mihiel. This precluded his driving his own truck, the authorities insisting that the drivers of trucks disclose two hands by count whether they lived in West Virginia or Timbuktu. The said Pajowski and another goop by the name of Higglebotham, fine old southern name, had loaded said melons, which ran 70 to the acre, level with the top of the fleeing truck's tailboard, which, in trucks of most American manufacture, is located in the rear. Then to the stimulant of much contraband corn, bought of a native who didn't pay dues to John L. Lewis by reason of not mining that sort of southern wealth, said one-armed owner and Goop Higglebotham had spread blankets on top of the melon load, deposited tire frames on said blankets, and told Pajowski, Home, Joseph. Pajowski had complied, bumped out of the melon field onto the road, and thereby bumped the one-armed owner off the blankets and onto the melons, which said blankets failed to cover. Said owner, being in great lassitude, on account of said corn, hadn't minded such a little thing as no blankets between him and the melons, till they came to the first West Virginia mountain grade. Then you conjecture what happened, but don't be too long about it. The truck, tilted at an angle of 45 degrees, had made of those melons level with the tailboard, perfect ensembles of gigantic ball bearings. Out into the cold and cruel West Virginia night, they'd rolled him, and the pavement came up and met his person. Whack! This was the tale we were told as West Virginia stars twinkled peacefully above us and big Blue Ridge crickets cheeped in the undergrowth. I gotta overtake that truck, the blood-smeared one roared, as though the thought had just occurred to him. What happens when Joe backs up to the storehouse, lowers the tailboard, and I ain't present? The thought of this petrified us. Joe might quit truck driving and go to John L. Lewis about it. I saw the necessity of overtaking that truck myself in the interest of stopping a national coal strike and shortage of fuel the ensuing winter. Think of the innocent women and children who'd freeze to death and their bodies not be found till spring. Okay, says I to Dan. Load him in. I'd overtake that truck if I had to chase it that mountain night to Montreal. I was so happy that my corpse, found on a lonely road, had merely gotten so from using melons as ball bearings that I would have even chased that machine to the Gulf of Boothia. We loaded old Bloody Nose into the rear beside Dan. I backed the Buick around somehow, and we headed north, where we belonged. Presently, Four miles back toward Bluefield, near the top of another grade, we overtook that crashing wagon with the melons bumping joyously in the party named Higglebotham, jiggled down among them so far that his head resembled a melon, only it wasn't green. I got around in front of 
I got around in front and motioned it to a stop. But stop a truck in West Virginia with, with the hour close to midnight? Try it sometime. That Pajowski was city bred. He'd heard of hijackers. He bumped me so hard that the four of us almost hit the road in a congregation of corpses, each possessed of two arms at that. We knocked off another mile before the owner's frantic waving convinced his driver he'd better halt. Thereat, when the owner climbed out of my car, the same owner who was supposed to be sleeping peacefully in Pajowski's rear on watermelons, Pajowski gave a squeal and well nigh took to brush himself, dropping off all arms as he went. How in the name of psychical research and 57 Polish deities all drunk on corn had such a transfer been made. My lady passenger clapped her hands over her ears when that one-armed tycoon of the melon trade informed his employee how he regarded him. Then what happened? When Pajowski got it through his Slavic intelligence, what had occurred, he lay down in the road himself and he roared with laughter. All the surrounding mountains jiggled. My reward for doing my good deed for the day we got a melon presented to us so sizable that we had to yank off a door to get it in the rear tunnel with Dan. When we reached home, we were two days consuming it. There's little moral to the tale and less psychical research, but the strangest things do happen in West Virginia. It's all good Americana. <laughs>